So, so who are you? Where are you in the world? Um, my name is Martin and I'm in Harlem, which is the most beautiful city in the Netherlands, sitting in my dining room, I suppose, in a beautiful winter day. The sun is shining, it's freezing, so it can't get much better than that, uh, from a Dutch perspective at least. So we're here today to, to discuss a project which I recently did for um, uh, the, the Global Center for Climate Mobility, a UN foundation. And I think what brought me here is wanting a, a love of for documentary photography for as long as I can remember. I think I had my first subscription on National Geographic and Time magazine uh, when, when I was 11. It, it, I, I, I loved exploring the world through photography and and a bit of a news junkie but that led me at a uh, fortunately at a certain stage to a career at world press photo where i spent a lot a lot of time actually initially on the exhibitions department but i quickly transitioned into the educational activities of the organization which but initially meant that we hosted master classes, we organized training programs, mainly in the developing world. And I met some wonderful and really inspiring people, which, which sent me on a mission, if you will, to enable photographers from around the world to tell their own stories. There's a wonderful uh, book that I read at a certain stage, which, which spoke about, imagine that we were, we, the UK, where you are, or the Netherlands, where I'm based, was represented solely by photographers from Nepal who didn't speak Dutch or English. And they said, well, that's actually the situation in most of the other uh, countries in the world where photographers don't speak or cameramen don't speak Arabic or Nepalese, and they're based in the capital. And then they go out if there's a story to be told. How would we feel about that? And would it give us different stories? I've never been truly convinced, but I do feel it's really a matter of respect. So I set out on that journey, which started with training, which became capacity building, as we called it at the time, which basically meant that, okay, great if somebody from Europe comes, but much better if we have the capability um, uh, to teach photojournalism in our countries ourselves and and what does that mean so that was a great experience a clean cut path my career um i, I would say not at all i got involved in um, the african climate mobility initiative uh, through a friend who recommended me to a friend uh, and that was around uh, december 2000 21 and it took a while because of Christmas and New Year before we eventually got the uh, for the conversation uh, started and this was a, an, a project which was had already been running for two years or maybe three years probably uh, there were if you go right back four years but it was about mapping the the consequences of climate change different climate change scenarios and different developmental scenarios for mobility in Africa. So if, and then between now and 2050. So if the emissions stayed high and, and temperatures rose, if development, um, uh, economic development, social development, yeah, didn't take the, the, the most ideal scenario, what would that mean for movement within Africa? And Columbia University was involved in modeling this work. So there was a lot of serious academic work had been done in, well, prior to me getting involved. But then they ended up with a report. And they knew that at that moment they had a challenge because academics are great at doing research they're not always the best communicators to a much wider audience. So that was the question that, that Kamal, the, the, the organization director, approached me with, Martin, can you help me develop a platform with which we can get this 
out towards a much larger, wider audience. Climate change isn't necessarily perceived as mobility, but already there, there's we're talking about framing and we're talking about communications because I think a lot of people are quite aware of the link between climate change and the potential for migration. But there is a very, uh, particularly in the West, uh, um, a negative uh, sound to the word migration. It's not perceived as something desirable at this stage unless it's within, well, within the European Union and I'll leave aside Brexit and the UK uh, for the moment. But already that choice for the word mobility is part of the communication efforts by this organization. Because if you look at, at Europe, we don't perceive that as a negative migration. People are moving around with skill sets that people can benefit from. They move somewhere for a couple of years, they move back. And there was this idea that, that the, the discussion needs to be reframed not only on the negative but also on the po potential positive impacts of people having to move either for always or temporarily or lead some kind of mobile existence because of changes to the climate. Some of the, the key challenges we faced when conceiving this project and I credit where credit is due, Kamal had already done a lot of thinking on it, was how are we going to get different audiences with different levels of interest to engage with the content? And that already meant that because a report was the basis, a report was the basis of this project. So there had to be a report, but there's very few people who have the time and the knowledge and, 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 and are willing to read uh, a, a hundred, two hundred page report full of formulas, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But yeah, it, we the, we couldn't let the challenge stop us there because the content was is too important. So how do we get other audiences to engage? And ideally, how do we get them to engage more uh, profoundly with the content that we present them with? So visuals where one way of telling the story, but they were also uh, a pathway into text uh, and ultimately into the report. So there was a whole thinking of in layers, basically, of, of different audiences, uh, different ways to access the, the information. So that was one, one very uh, yeah, fundamental challenge, if you will, which I think we, we managed to deal with. The challenge that we, where there is still room for improvement, and this has to do with the timing that is available in, in these projects is, and because it's a project also the longevity of these initiatives is how do we enable engagement? How do we truly make, we have all this wonderful content, how do we actually get it shared? And, and there's still a challenge there. Luckily, we have new opportunities in the future, looking at other regions of the world, but there is that challenge because we don't only want people to take that information in. Ideally, we want to share it, them to share it. We want them to talk about it. And we want them to become, yeah, sorry. We want them to become engaged with that, with that content. Climate change is global, but solutions are local. And if you look at, at the African political system, a lot of the decision-making is very centralized. But solutions are local. So how do we get this information to... Um, new groups of stakeholders, local policymakers, local journalists, local academics that can use this information. That's really one of the things that, that's changed and it, it was a fundamental starting point that these stories are going to be told by African uh, storytellers, which we did throughout the project. Uh, yes, there was a, a small a contingency budget if we couldn't find someone, but uh, even in a place like uh, Somaliland, Somalia, we, through networks, we found very competent and capable uh, photographers. So, so that was great. Um, I think I missed one of the one of the challenges, one of the main challenges, and this last one was a very uh, practical one, if you will. But one of the main communication challenges was that 
climate change is something that evolves very slowly. It's difficult to, to get a sense of urgency. Um, it is something that is very often uh, hi not hidden, but described in dense reports. And how do you get people, how do you create awareness? How do you create understanding? How do you create a sense of urgency about climate change? And I think the way we resolved that was, yes, there were words because this we also want to stimulate it. We also want to stimulate a facts-based discussion, an academically rooted in, in academic research. But at the same time, it needs to be accessible. So we use data visualizations. And data visualizations are great tools for projections to the future, are great tools if you have complex information to simplify it, to make it immediately accessible. But that still doesn't necessarily move people. There's still not an emotive response to data visualizations as much as I like them. And that's where the photography and the video came in, because there you could tell very small stories, which became examples for the larger trends and which drew people in and they could say hey this is not only going to happen here the flooding or new cyclones it's not only mozambique but look coasts of egypt or, or senegal are also prone to uh, sea level or also vulnerable to sea level rise so we're going to have some of these same phenomena taking place in these areas and that combination of data visualizations a lot of maps photography and text was a great way of yeah, closing that, that that feedback loop between this is now, this is going to happen in the future. How do we understand that relationship? I think the wonderful thing about where we are right now is one, the amount of research that is being done in all these areas is huge. Two, it's easy to it, it's more easy than ever to find these people to access their research i think there's a, a much stronger awareness that message needs to be put out in the public domain so i think there's a willingness to cooperate and it's not only research and photography there's other tools like data visualizations video animations all which can be used now in in which is fantastic as they've never as we've never been able to use them before there are more means of communications at our disposal cheaper easier faster it's easier to reach out to other people than there i think there have ever been to date and most certainly compared to 10 15 20 years ago challenges i've faced in, in creative projects wide and varied and i think one of the probably one of the most fundamental and often overlooked is do we actually understand it? each other are we talking about the same thing and two great examples and this is a while ago we were doing a project on gender funded by an international ngo who wanted who had certain interests in what in, in thinking about gender and we were in sri lanka and we found out that there wasn't a word there wasn't a sinhalese translation for the word gender so where do you start a discussion from that point it, it, and, and it actually, we went back to the funder. So, because we felt that was also only respectful from the, 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 the point of Sri Lanka, you know, we needed to find a new word. It, it, it just wasn't there. And the same applied uh, in Mali to uh, environment where there is, there, they only had a very uh, classical definition of environment, which meant your surroundings. And there wasn't this connotation of, something that needed to be cared for that needed to be cherished that needs to be protected or cleaned or so are we talking about the same thing and i think that applies to in general the uh, um if you're talking about a story are we talking about the same thing but then do we understand each other all the way down when we're when when we're producing the story what is it exactly that you want i, I would recommend people engage with the with their clients to really understand the assignment that they've been given because and this is something i experienced i have i want something i'm looking for something but the reality is that i am not on the ground in 
uh, Nigeria or Mozambique or Uganda. It, 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 it's yes, I have scientific data, but you also need to find that story. And that story is probably going to be slightly different from, from what the research has described based on aggregated metadata. But if you understand, and this is what I really appreciated with one of the photographers, she would call, she would say, okay, I've, I've found this. Does this meet your requirements? And it was really a discussion which brought us to her eventual topic. And that was very much her curiosity, her perseverance, her wanting to do some to, to do a really good job, which led to this dialogue and a larger understanding eventually de- leading to, to her story. Yeah, talking about practicalities, I think you also have to probably protect yourself uh, to a degree. You can receive a brief. This is one of the things that I learned in the in, in this project. We wrote extensive briefs and we had ideas, but there's always stuff that is missing. So as we progressed in the project, we built in a halfway point and we wanted to receive materials. And with the editor, I would look at the materials and then we would give feedback rather than saying, okay, this is what we want and expecting someone to get it all right at once. So I think that's that's something very practical advice, you know, make that halfway point so there is still space to to maneuver and to meet the client's expectations. Um, One of the things that I, I haven't appreciated enough or I haven't been conscious enough about is relations. Build relations with clients. It's not only about how, yes, it's very important, how good the work is that you deliver, but at the same time, people want to work with people they like, people they trust, and that goes beyond the immediate assignment. So there is, it, you can't be academic about managing relations, but it is something to be conscious about. It is something not to forget uh, while you're working on an assignment. Uh, and, and also afterwards, uh, yes, do send someone uh, a picture of your latest project uh, six months afterwards or or a year afterwards, just because they appreciate that you think of them and they know the underlying messaging, but they probably also appreciated the relationship you had with them at the time. And then if uh, an opportunity arises in the future, it's likely that you're going to be one of the first that they, they call. Shared, shared understanding is not only something that is at play when I'm assigning someone, it's also at play within in the team of it within the production team or the post production team that I'm I'm working with uh, in this case. Well, which was mainly in the Netherlands in this case, and this had to do with writers and designers um, and and editors um, and and myself. Uh, one of the one of the assignments that the the designing the design team got was it needs to have an African an African look. It needs to have, it, Africa, it's the African Climate Mobility Initiative. There needs to be a sense of Africa. Um, they, with all their good intentions, aren't African, haven't been exposed to Africa a lot. So it was uh, a, a discussion which lasted a while between, between the team to get that right. Another aspect where it came into play was the color corrections in the video. Um, it was all made very clean, Western, if you will. But what does the rainy season in Africa look like? What does the light look like at that point in time? What does the grass look like? In Because it, initially it, there's still a lot of dust. And this was an example of Senegal. At the beginning of the rainy season, it's not all beautiful green spring grass that like we have here in Europe. There, The dust is being washed away the light is diffuse and these are things that you don't if you haven't been there if you haven't seen it if you haven't experienced it where you are yeah obviously likely to make mistakes because you're using your own reference frame your own yeah your own experience as a starting point and this was this meant a lot of discussion it, it just meant a, a lot of trying to describe what that means, pointing out examples of uh, 
um, other people who have dealt with it. And this is the look and feel that we want. And it was an iterative process where, where which we had to reach together. Let, let, let me put it that way. Um, uh, so that's a shared understanding. And, and it becomes, I suppose, even more complex when, when shared understanding becomes. So how do we marry all the different forms of content? How do we bring all of that together? How does text reinforce photography and photography reinforce text how does design reinforce all three how do the data visualizations reinforce everything and vice versa how do we bring that together and that is actually a, a position a role as a, a, an editor-in-chief really to to hold that together and, and to be thinking of that in, in advance before it happens and getting people to rewrite or to re-edit or to redesign stuff to find the right match at the right point on the platform. So there too, it was a laborious, but a lot of love, care and dedication to make it work. So if, if I were to recommend certain aspects of the site to people, I I think the first thing I would do is the, is the two short videos, one on um, uh, Mozambique, and the other on uh, Ethiopia, uh, and, and the, the Ethiopian example, well, they both speak to me. I'll, I'll take the Ethiopian uh, example of where a, a woman, uh, a young woman has had to leave her family uh, because of changing weather patterns. The family can no longer sustain her, has difficulty sustaining themselves, but her future has, she wanted to, like all of us, to pursue a career based on her studies, but she never got the opportunity. And she moved to, to a bigger city, Adama, where she found work at a, a Chinese company that takes in migrants, specifically organized by the city council of Adama. And from there, she earns money and maintains her family. It is speaks to a very large theme of a very large trend of people moving from the countryside to cities in Africa. It speaks to, to policy in Africa. I think we, we shouldn't, be, there's lots of things happening there and, and quite a number of positive things happening. And, and I, and what I really liked was personally was the quality of the work. So that, that, that story works on a lot of layers, which I really like. Another aspect for me is all the data visualizations. So the, if you scroll right down to the bot, to, to the lower end of the site, there are tons of maps which you can play around with, which show you 2030, 40, 50, when it comes to flooding, when it comes to population density, when it comes to conflict. And you can overlay all these things and get it. it it's it's, it's yeah, nearly mind boggling and yet presented in quite a neat and clean way. And it's just, if you're exploit, it's a great tool to explore what is happening on the continent. And then a third aspect is I would recommend you actually read one of the chapters because a lot of, and this is just because I know how much uh, thought went into actually synthesizing and making the information from the, the report, which is part of the website, accessible to a wider audience. And that, I think just that the thinking and the care uh, that went into that merits that, that attention. Well, first of all, you can see this interview has taken a bit of time. The sun has set. <laughs> it's, it's winter, so it's early. But Jonathan told me that it's a mixed audience that is listening to this, what do we call this, to this video uh, that is participating in this course. And th yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd like to lay down a challenge for you because you've I've told you about some of the things that we tried to achieve with this site. I've told you about some of the challenges we face, some of the issues where I feel we've been less successful but I'd like to hand that over to you. How would you communicate these messages to an audience? How would you do it? How would you improve the site? And I'd love to hear your feedback. You can reach me on Twitter. Jonathan is going to share that with you. And I'm really looking forward to, to hearing from you. Thank you. Thank you.